Thank you very much um, and good morning. Um, but I'm very honoured to be here today and it's lovely to see so many familiar faces. Um, I thank particularly the Congress organisers uh, for the um, invitation to, go, to come here and speak and I'm very honoured. Um, I also congratulate them on uh, this uh, successful Congress. Um, I also send uh, to the um, Indian Society of Engineering Geology from the Engineering Geological Group of the uh, Geological Society of London our great best wishes for uh, your 50th anniversary. Um, this morning I'm going to talk to you about the challenges of an engineering geologist in the digital area of communication. And firstly, we'll have a little uh, overview of some of the ways that we've presented in the past. Um, but then I want to talk about a number of challenges that I see we have now and also uh, challenges in the future. So over many years we've communicated our uh, geological, our engineering geology and our geotechnical information through a number of ways. And we've done this through the creation of maps, uh, through models, through graphic logs um, and certainly these are just a selection of, of shall I say, a few of my favourites. Um, we created uh, maps uh, from the first geological map that was developed around Bath for William Smith, uh, where he created uh, a small scale map of a city, um, to now how we generate maps uh, both in paper form and digital format. But of course we've done that through many years, we've created models, even the very first block models were created out of wood and also created plans and information. The, at the bottom, in the middle of the slide, is actually um, one, my hometown, Newcastle upon Tyne, in the northeast of England. And this is actually one of the first maps that I've found, where we've got information on ground investigation borings in the River Tyne, the famous River Tyne where coal comes from, where they put information around the lithology and the geology that was found in the borings. And that was done by a famous engineer in the northeast no known as John Dobson in 1836. So we've created different scales and sizes of maps. And of course, the most fam famous map there, the first map, uh, first national map in the United Kingdom um, of, from William Smith. And for those of you that are not familiar with it, um, there's a new version here for people to see later. Um, and he created that map in uh, 1815. But of course, as engineering geologists, uh, we have many different ways to create data, but quite often the way we portray and communicate our data, particularly in the past, has actually been through technical reports, through laboratory, geotechnical information, uh, through specialist technical reports, which generally have always gone to a technical community, the civil engineering community, for example, but actually also um, 20, over 20 and 30 years ago, certainly gone out to um, planners and uh, developers. And then uh, we've also created uh, thematic iterative uh, interpretive maps. And these are just a few of some of the more colourful versions of those thematic maps. Uh, a, a really good summary for those that don't know um, Bill Dearman's book on engineering geology. Uh, and these are just a selection of a few of the uh, more colourful favourites over the years. We've got the 1940s engineering geology map of Prague. And the idea in that map was trying to show lithology and the variation of superficial lithology and bedrock ge geology in 2D on one sheet of paper. And actually also the small, the small numbers that are there are highlighting the thickness of that su uh, superficial deposits. And then we have the uh, BRGM, uh, 1972, moving into the 70s with the uh, very colourful schematical map trying to uh, indicate around the area of Creel uh, foundation conditions. And then a map um, that BGS has uh, uh, undertaken in the late 1990s, developing applied planning maps around the city of Bradford where information was portrayed to help understand where problematic ground conditions were and potential for geohazards and how that could affect problems around building and development in that region. Now, more and more as we move on, we're actually starting to communicate with a much wider community of stakeholders. 
Uh, and that information, we're having to think of different ways and techniques of uh, uh, supplying that information, most likely in a digital format, uh, but creating information for such people as developers, financiers, planners, dare I say, it, lawyers, surveyors, uh, conservationists, and actually also much more the general public. Uh, but that information needs to be portrayed so they understand it, and actually, most importantly, they understand the uncertainty around that. So we can't just portray uh, a digital map. It needs information to help the understanding of that information so it can be used uh, uh, effectively and, of course, sustainably in the future. So now I just want to go through some communication challenges. And these are just a highlight of some of the things that I think as uh, an engineering geologist uh, trying to work in our new digital area, uh, we have and the technical challenges and some of the things we need to consider. So communication challenge one, advances in information technology and other technologies are changing how us as engineering geologists, as geotechnical engineers, as geologists, provide information and make it available to that wide variety of stakeholders now. So more and more, we're providing information in a digital format. We are, in particular, in more recent date, uh, years, uh, manipulating di digital data. Uh, we're providing digital geoscientific information, whether it's engineering geological, geotechnical, even environmental data, in um, uh, geospatial uh, information systems, such as systems like ArcGIS and MapInfo, and using that data to portray our information. Uh, but of course, we're portraying that in a variety of ways. Just a few examples here through um, uh, geo, uh, ArcGIS as we shape files up in the top right, um, to web mapping services on the web that provide geological information and maps. This is just one example that we have in the UK from BGS of the Geology of Britain viewer. But also, uh, using those web mapping services that to then create applications and apps that then can go on um, your mobile phones and tablet, tablet laptops. Um, but actually, also, the other revelation, particularly we're seeing much more now, is the use of mobile technology out in the field. So we create and collect data as a desktop study. So we have our uh, remote sensing data, we have our geological map data, our topography data, aerial photographs, and we compile that information and take it out into the field through mobile technology. And then actually uh, put our observational work from our field work back onto that system and then enable to efficiently and effectively and quickly upload that information directly into our systems. So it's changing the way we work and changing um, the um, procedures and protocols in how we work both uh, at the desk and also out in the field. But of course, we're also using ways to still communicate the information of our interpretive maps that I showed before. This is just one example that's quite close to my heart. It's the engineering one to a million scale engineering geology map of the UK, where we use um, GIS systems to use digital geological data and then uh, bring in a number of other data sources like geotechnical data, geo borehole information to actually enable us to create the uh, interpretive engineering geological map. And we've been able to do that um, both for superficial and uh, bedrock hard rock geology. And that enables us then to provide that information which can help young professionals and also the wider civil engineering community to better understand geological formations and the potential hazards around that. And again, there's now a web mapping system at BGS, which um, the uh, web address at the bottom for those that are interested. But actually more and more to the wider stakeholder community, we're being asked questions. And those questions are very often um, communicated through decision support systems, where we can again bring a multitude of data together uh, through uh, web mapping services, through the use of uh, geographical information systems, such things as satellite data, um, geological data, land use information, population information. And this is an example from a European project which is uh, funded, uh, funded by the European Union. It's called Pangeo. It was a project that was looking at uh, the potential uh, 
geological hazards within uh, urban city centres uh, within Europe. And that was uh, asking the question of where do we have uh, problematic ground, where do we have potential geohazards in the urban areas, and how do we portray that information so land use planners within European cities can be better informed. And the success of it is that it's a, a, a more widely freely available system that can actually help inform those um, uh, city developers. But of course, much more. One of the things that we have seen um, widely uh, change the way that we work is actually how we model, particularly in 3D, our geological, geotechnical, um, environmental data particularly. And there are a number of tools and methodologies that now enable us to do that, a lot of different softwares. These are just a few of the favourites that we use. Um, so GoCAD, where you can create surfaces and faults. Um, we use GSI 3D, it's a, a, a piece of software we use in BGS to particularly help us understand quaternary deposits which are complex and more difficult to use in some of the more standard modelling softwares. But of course then using that modelling software to help us under understand um, physical properties, whether they're geotechnical properties or actually petrophysical properties as the oil industry does. And Petrel is one of the ones that are used particularly for this in the oil industry where we end up with voxelated models and similarly we use um, for some of the geotechnical um, modelling that we do uh, also GoCAD. And actually there is a, a, a really, although it's at the bottom of the slide, there is a, a source at the bottom of the slide um, which comes from um, the IAG Commission 25 uh, led by Steve Parry and colleagues from the IAG which gives a lovely overview of uh, modelling for engineering geology applications. Um, I recommend certainly that you go and uh, look at that resource. It gives an informative background to how and some of the debate about how we can use models in engineering geology. But of course there are different ways to model. And certainly the two that I'm most familiar with are the deterministic and stochastic way of modelling. Um, deterministic models, which are the... Um, expert-driven, uh, time-consuming modelling techniques which enable us to, uh, as engineering geologists and geologists, use our expert knowledge to create those models. And the more um, geostatistical, uh, stochastical and analytical uh, uh, mathematical techniques where you use existing data sets from boreholes and geotechnical information from uh, laboratory work to enable you to look at the distribution of potential um, variables, such as uh, density, for example, and create uh, 3D models around those properties. But it used the, is the historical data to create scenarios and iterations around that. And I'll just show a few examples now around those two different techniques. So we have deterministic modeling, and this is just a workflow we use at BGS where we use digital terrain models, map geological information. Uh, we use boreholes um, uh, information to then create, of course, the geological cross-section or the geotechnical cross-section. Um, and then using those cross-sections, creating a nest of fence, uh, fence diagrams to create our block model and our surfaces. Um, the benefit of this is it's, uh, it enables you to do, apply this methodology in most locations. Um, you're not restricted by the amount of data and information you have, say, from boreholes. Um, but the challenge is that you need uh, that expert and the time of the expert to do the interpretation. Another technique that we use um, and have trialled and compared to the deterministic model is st stochastic modelling. And this is actually an example from a project up in Glasgow in Scotland um, where we've used... Uh, uh, lithological uh, models um, to, to be generated from uh, borehole information where we have um, 50, uh, uh, 500 examples of lithologies and we can actually then realise uh, doing iterations uh, we can run those models and come up with scenarios about the generated stochastic modelled uh, lithologies and we've actually found that um, a very useful technique um, the benefit around that technique is um, it's uh, generated more by a mathematical computer-led model, so it's less labour-intensive. 
The challenge around it is you need very good, very high quality data and information. It works very well in Glasgow and it actually works really well in quite complex superficial deposits which is where this example is from. And of course when you have these models, particularly around the stochastic models, you can create slices and maps. And this is just an example from the lithologies. At different depths you can actually look particularly at the probability of different uh, lithologies at different depths. Um, it helps us uh, with the challenge of understanding uncertainty and the realisation of that uncertainty and being able to portray that to other people. Um, but of course it's uh, very useful uh, when designing things like foundations. This is just one example that we have worked with Glasgow City Council on. But of course there are pros and cons with both techniques. The deterministic model, as I mentioned, um, you need um, borehole data, you need a, a, an experienced and well-qualified and well-trained um, engineering geologist or uh, geolog geologist to understand the geology, who has the background for the interpretation. There is less demand on, on the amount of data um, compared to the stochastic model where you need um, high-quality data um, to a large, uh, a, a large quality, a large quantity and large quality of that data to help with the iterations. Uh, and there needs to be um, some validation as well of that data where you have limited data resources. So there are benefits of both, but certainly through the work that we're doing and also as part of the geological survey work we're doing at BGS, we're very conscious about how to portray the, uh, the uncertainty and also create um, some of the knowledge around tr uh, transposing that uncertainty and trying to put um, some numbers around that. So we actually have started to look at various property models, um, geotechnical properties such as um, uh, density data and calculated densities around um, the same sort of techniques that I've just shown for lithology. And we can model it at the top and the bottom and this, this is just an example of the top and the bottom of the superficial, the quaternion deposits in this area in Glasgow. And from these um, models you can then actually create density uh, um, variograms on the statistics of the different types of lithologies or the different densities, for example, for the different uh, types of lithologies we, we encounter. And you get an idea of the spatial variability then of the data within these regions. There are the usual health warnings with these, and of course, as you've seen some from, from some of the variograms, it's very dependent on the data you have and the quantity of data and how that's interpreted. But again, we can then use some of those um, data sets to actually create simulations. For example, this is just one simple simulation of bulk density. Um, we can create cross-sections through that model. And then, of course, uh, the most important thing is actually to create different iterations and different simulations of that density, 10 times, 100 times, to see how the realizations change that model. And actually, also, from that model, you can then get some um, meaningful statistics um, if you've got good quality data to look at things like mean values, the standard deviation of values. So this gives us a workflow around, uh, particularly for this, it's a workflow around urban modelling. It gives us different techniques to use in different situations where we can actually use a mixture of both stoch stochastic and deterministic techniques um, and enable those workflows to actually feed into iterations as well. And then most importantly, those models in, of the lithology and the geological environment can then feed into other um, uh, parameterized models. One example of where we used uh, in Glasgow is applying the density and some correlations to then help with the groundwater modeling. So that was just a very quick tour through the challenge one I highlighted. The next challenge I think uh, I just want to talk about is the different types of digital engineering geological information and how it's being uh, increasingly available for both larger urban areas rather than just site-specific areas. And probably this is something that as a geological survey and the work we do in the geological survey we're um, a lot more conscious of because it affects some of the daily work we do. And that more and more in a number of countries around the world this sort of work is actually feeding into a wider agenda. 3D modelling has uh, always been extensively done by architects above surface, but actually more and more what we're seeing 
is um, countries taking up the new um, development of building information models and the theories and systems with those. So now what we're seeing is that buildings, infrastructure and um, uh, utilities are being planned around that. And this is just an example of that model. And this model shows the integration of a utility system and how that utility system is integrated. Um, and how we can then make decisions about the vulnerability of that uh, asset and how that can affect the potential um, groundwater aquifer underneath. So it's really helping us to improve our knowledge of the interaction between both the built and the um, natural environment. But of course we have other techniques and methodologies. We have 3D models, that's great, but actually much more what we're seeing is the visualisation of both 3D property models into 4D temporal models. And using geophysics as one of the tools to do this, this is an, just a small example of where um, electrical resistivity is using, being used to actually monitor an embankment and understand some of the problems that could potentially happen with stability. And the importance around this, particularly for asset owners, is how this can help uh, with understanding the future lifetime and of that asset and help with asset maintenance. But the important thing is, of course, data management around this and understanding how data uh, is um, portrayed, monitored, and most importantly, has a standard method of collection. And through the AGS um, uh, system of data transfer that's been developed in the UK, but taken up by a number of countries such as Hong Kong, Singapore, um, and development around the DIG system in the US, it's enabling data to be transferred, geotechnical data primarily, um, between organisations. So the general rule is we have data that can be entered once and be used by many different projects. And we have a, a project in um, Glasgow that is looking at this, where we can exchange knowledge and information. Um, it's been uh, encouraged by Glasgow City Council. They see the benefit of sharing data around their consultants and contractors to enable better decision making around sustainable development. And there's a good stakeholder group that works with that. And the key thing is, as I mentioned before, it means we get data in a regular format. It means it can be shared between all parties. And it means that actually that can be reused and the value in that data is realized. And we have a system known as a, a G-Spec portal, which is helping people to do that. BGS is very actively involved in collating that geotechnical data so it can be reused by parties of the network. And actually, it's been taken up in wider stakeholder engagement. So the final um, challenge is engineering and geologists are working more in partnership with stakeholders uh, and social scientists. And this is really something that you've seen some examples in the urban environment, but actually more and more we're doing it within the geohazard environment. And particularly providing more information for um, the public uh, and the responder community, the blue flashing light community around um, uh, information. People don't understand what these geological hazards are. They want to know what they do in a situation when they happen, uh, where they're meant to go and what actions need to be taken. And this is where we're trying to help with this. Creation uh, of a daily hazard assessment is helping with this um, and helping to feed into that. So there are the three um, challenges that I wanted to mention. But in the future, I think we have very similar challenges. Um, where we have um, to take these things forward. And of course, the key thing around this is actually understanding uh, uncertainty. And that, I think, as a community, is a big challenge we need to take forward in the future. And we need to build on our knowledge and ensure it is effectively and appropriately communicated, of course. And it might be that we have to come out of our comfort zone and sometimes use systems which we're not familiar with. Um, this is an example of Minecraft where we've done that to put geological information into children's computer games, but it helps to, uh, those children to understand for the future what geology in the subsurface is. And of course, there is something else which I think is another simple technique, and actually you can also do it with Lego. So really, I just want to wrap up there and say thank you very much. I'd like to acknowledge a number of my co-contributors from BGS and also the help of the data and information from the IAG uh, Commission 25. Thank you.